Most of us remember with 9-11. On 9-12, we were almost afraid to turn the TV on. Is there going to be another terrorist attack somewhere? And, and, I, and I, I ask people to imagine that on 9-12 you turned it on and, and 7,000 people were killed in Philadelphia. Or on 9-13 you turned your TV on and 8,000 people were killed in Savannah, Georgia. Or on 9-15, 16, 17, into October 11. November 11, could we imagine the scale of killing going on day after day? So it was just hard that nobody, this wasn't stopping. Nobody seemed to be coming to stop. The Rwandan genocide was the mass killings of nearly 1 million native Rwandans over 100 days in 1994, from April to mid-July. That is about seven people being murdered every minute. Ignited by the April 6th assassination of Rwandan President Habyarimana, these crimes stemmed from an ethnic conflict between the Hutu and Tutsi tribes of Rwanda that was a direct product of Belgian colonization in the early 1900s. The Belgians, before giving Rwanda its independence in 1962, separated native Rwandans into Hutu and Tutsi, giving the small group of Tutsis absolute governmental power. After the Belgians left Rwanda, the Hutus retaliated against the Tutsis by passing unfair laws, preventing the creation of an equally representative government for both ethnic groups. The Rwandan Patriotic Front, a Tutsi rebel group, threatened the fragile stability in 1993 by invading northern Rwanda with the intent of overthrowing the Hutu-led government, creating an internal civil war. Worried that they might have to respect the civil rights of all Rwandans, the Hutus systematically began murdering innocent, moderate Hutu and Tutsi refugees. Like in the Holocaust, identification cards and radio broadcasts, which communicated propaganda, were used to separate and isolate the two ethnic groups. At the end of World War II, the United Nations vowed the world would never allow genocides like the Holocaust to occur again. But genocides continued to occur in places such as Indonesia, Burundi, and Bosnia. As the genocide in Rwanda began, UN leaders, fresh off the 1993 disastrous failure of Somalia, were concerned about the political fallout of the death of Western citizens. It is a very tense situation, and I just want to assure the families of those who are there that we are doing everything we possibly can to be on top of the situation, to uh, take all appropriate steps uh, to try to ensure the safety of, of our citizens there. As a result, the UN deemed relief efforts too risky and decided to evacuate all Westerners out of Rwanda. As the UN turned its back on the Rwandan people, Carl Wilkins, a young humanitarian aid worker, refused to leave his fellow man in Rwanda and became the only United States citizen who stayed. Carl Wilkins stayed because leaving his home there would mean leaving the two people living in his house who happened to be a Hutu and a Tutsi. He knew that if he left, they would ultimately be killed. He could not fathom leaving his friends in the midst of all the fighting remembering the many kind things they had done for him during his stay in Rwanda. Their children played with his children, and their families ate dinner with his family. Carl realized that just praying for these people would not be enough. With no doubt in his mind, Carl sent his family off to a safer region of Africa while he stayed with and eventually saved the lives of his family, friends, and countless others. The United States government wanted Carl to evacuate Rwanda with every other American, but he refused. Laura Lane, U.S. Embassy Consular Officer, tried to convince Carl to leave. However, he steadfastly refused and signed a statement acknowledging he was no longer under the protection of the U.S. government. Laura is you know, a wonderful person. She was doing her job. She said, Carl, you have to go. There's no choice. And I said, well, there is. We do have a choice, and I'm not going. Carl was unable to leave his home for three weeks, surviving off the little food and water his neighbors could find. These neighbors watched out for Carl and even saved his life at moments warning him of death threats circulating the nearby village. After three weeks, Carl realized the UN was not going to step in to end the genocide, so he left his house, risking his life in the crossfire, bringing medication and supplies for Tutsis living nearby. However, Carl realized he was there to do something more. 45 minutes away from his house, the Gasimba Orphanage, housing 400 Tutsi children and adults, was rumored to be the next target for Hutu militiamen. When Carl found out about the imminent danger of the orphanage, he rushed to the scene to try and stop the impending massacre. After negotiating with the murderous militia, Carl knew he could not save them alone. And the brother tells me, you know, they, uh, they really want to kill my, 
my older brother today. In fact, they're going to kill all of us. The young brother said, no, don't go. They're going to kill us as soon as you leave. And I said to him, you know, I, I, I promised him. I, I promised him I'll come back. At great risk to his own safety, Carl immediately drove to the Rwandan Prime Minister's office to personally negotiate the protection of those in the orphanage. This was very dangerous because Prime Minister Kabanda was the governmental leader in charge of the killings. He was fully aware of Carl's work and agreed to release the orphans, afraid of the press and of the possibility that the international community would step in. This act saved everyone seeking refuge in the orphanage.